Praise the Lord, everybody. All right, let's get started here. I'm trying to get this book to stay over. All right, uh, uh, we're doing uh, lesson 1.3 today, and the title of this lesson is Offering Offering Our Best. Um, Brother Chuck, could you get Genesis 4, 1 through 15 up on the screen? That way I don't have to use my phone to hold the book down. Offering our best. How many knows we need to give our best every day of our life? We need to give we need to give God our best. We need to give other people our best. We need to give our best. The lesson big idea is I will offer God my best. And we all could say that together, say it together. I will offer God my best. I will offer God my best. We should wake up every morning and say that. Say that little saying, I will offer God my best. The focus verse comes out of Genesis 4 and 4. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of, the flo of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Like I said, the lesson text comes out of Genesis 4, 1 through 15. Uh, and we also will be in Romans a little bit, 7, 14 through 20. Uh, the truth about God is God expects us to give our best to him. Amen. How many knows that's an expectation God has of us that we offer our very best? We're going to talk a little about Cain and Abel and the, and, and the sacrifice that he, God received one sacrifice and not the other. Uh, uh, you know, the Bible really don't say why he, he received one and not the other. He did say that Abel walked, gave his by faith. Uh, but other than that, it really don't um, really don't say why God didn't accept Cain's sacrifice. Other than what I believe it must have been something in his heart that that God just did not like and caused him not to accept that sacrifice. Uh, the lesson connection, and I want to read this. It's kind of interesting. It uh, the boy sobbed, despising the situation. His favorite uncle had just punished him for what he thought was such a minor infraction. He was not crying due to physical pain. He was crying because his uncle had dared to correct a favorite nephew. The young boy's infraction was watching his uncle weld without the boy wearing a welder's helmet. Was the uncle hateful to be so stern with his young nephew? Considering that this type of prolonged activity would have allowed uh, ultraviolet radiation to cause damage to the young boy's eyes, it would have been wrong to let the infraction to go uncorrected. The boy would not have detected the damage until hours later, and a repeated injury of that sort might have resulted in cataracts. Teaching the nephew to take care of his eyes was one of the kindest things the uncle could do. The Bible warns, now this is in Isaiah 5 and 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If we are not careful, even though we should know better, we will react as the author did when he had a preteen peeking in at his uncle's welding ark. We will mistake an act of kindness for someone being hateful. And that is what's happening today. You know, uh, people are mistaking an act of kindness from the church. You know, you got to live right. You can't live in sin. You, there's... Uh, you know, gay marriage is wrong, you know, all this. And they're mistaken at it as, a, as that act of kindness. The church is telling them, hey, that's sin. You, you'll be lost for that. And they're, they're taking that as, 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 as the church being hateful, and that's not the case. The truth is, it is sometimes more hateful not to point out the dangers of certain activities, and that is certain a, a truth today. Kindness chooses to hold fast to biblical morals and values in spite of politically correct rhetoric that deems such expressions as love, as hateful. Here's just a, a few examples of kind words. 
Don't stick, th how many ever have told this to your kids? Don't stick things in the electric socket. You ever told your kids that? Was you being mean and telling them that? They thought that was fun and that's something to do. That's interesting because they see adults plug things in. So they think they can stick a, a something, whatever else in there. But that's an act of kindness on our part. Because why? Because we know they will get hurt. Because that could end their life if they stick something in there and give them the shock of their life anyway. May not kill them, but it would sure wake them up a little bit, wouldn't it, Mike? <laughs> Anybody ever touched a wire? You ever touched one? You felt that going down your arm, didn't you? Don't play in traffic or play with guns. Are those hateful words we tell our kids? No, no. Don't play in traffic. You know, don't, don't get out in the middle of the road and play. Why? Because it's dangerous. They take it as being hateful and not letting them do what they want to do. Do you know what? All, sometimes doing what you want to do isn't right for your life. Sometimes the kids think they can do what they want to do. It's sometimes it's very, it, it'll cause problems in their life and it'll cause um, bad things to happen in their life. So those are some kind words. Another kind word is not all roads lead to heaven. That is so true. Unkind words we can tell people, whatever feels good, do it. Those are unkind words. Those are bad words to tell people. Whatever feels good, don't do it. Because some, more, than, more often than not, if it feels good, it's going to bring harm to your life. Uh, another unkind word we can tell people, God doesn't care how you behave. Many other unkind words we can tell people and not tell them the truth. And that's the most horrible thing we can do is not tell people the truth. Not tell people the truth. As any school teacher will confirm, children left to their own judgment rarely create a safe and healthy learning environment. God's people should be thankful he has given us kind words to help us understand what behaviors he expects. God expected behaviors will help us live the abundant life he has promised. When he teaches his children to give him the best, they benefit because it frees him to give them his best. And that is so true. Let's go to the scriptures, Genesis chapter 4, verses 1. 1 through 15, let's, let's read those, then we'll get into the lesson here. These are really, really good lessons, and uh, uh, it's, you know, it ain't going to be nothing that you haven't heard before, you know, we've all been in this for years, and we've heard these lessons, you know, we, we all know, uh, we all choose every day, we got the battle of good and evil every day in our life, we got, we have, we have to choose Good or we have to choose evil. I mean, it ain't nothing. It's not going to be nothing new to you, but it should be a constant reminder because when we choose evil, bad things happen. Genesis uh, 4, verse 1, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Mm -hmm. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt thou if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And God asked Cain a question there. And I, I just kind of popped out at me when I was reading this the other day. The question God asked Cain, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shalt be his desire, and shalt rule, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth. Unto me from the ground. And now 
Art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand? When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out uh, driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken of him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And I read those, and 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 it just really goes to show there how, how God is so merciful. You know, God could have killed Cain, you know, for not accepting that sacrifice. He didn't accept the sacrifice. And, and I, I believe in my heart that, that he could offer another sacrifice and God would have accepted that if he changed his heart and it was right. But, but you know, what happened? He went out and got mad at his brother and killed his brother. And so God, God uh, uh, punished him, cursed him. But you know what? We have to realize, we're going to start here in, in the first section here, uh, part one here, the battle between good and evil. God always will tell us what he expects. How many believes that? The word of God will always tell us what, what, what he expects of us. He, 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 the word of God is very plain how we get to heaven. The word of God is, the word of God is very plain of, how, of what God expects from man. It's plain. Because of his goodness, God has communicated to humanity what he expects through his word. His word includes promises and messages of hope. However, God has made it clear that for the most part, his blessings and promises are contingent on humanity's obedience. And we have to understand that sometimes his blessings and promises are contingent on if we're, if we're obedient or not. Amen? Hey Amen. I, I receive a paycheck from the school, and I have to show up and do the work that they I'm contracted to do in order to get that paycheck. If I don't show up, and I run out of sick time and vacate and whatever days I have to build up to get paid, I'm going to quit getting a paycheck. They're not going to just pay me for nothing. Sometimes that's the way God is. His promises and his blessings are contingent on our, our obedience to his word. And we have to be obedient to the word of God. Deuteronomy 30 and 15 through 19 says, See, have I set before thee this day life and good, and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the, to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so God said here, if you obey me, if you do what I tell you to do, you're going to possess that land, you're gonna, I'm going to give you everything I told you I was going to give you, it's going to be contingent on your obedience to me. But here it says, but if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear. If you, if you don't hear me, if you get belligerent with me, if you, if you want to be stubborn as humans can be stubborn, this is going to happen to you. God always gives us the flip side of the coin. He always tells us, hey, this is going to happen if you, you obey. This is going to happen if you don't obey. Just like heaven and hell, if you, if you obey my commandments, if you're baptized in the name of Jesus, you receive the Holy Ghost, you live a holy life, I'm going to take you to heaven. But if you don't, there's going to be another place for you that you're going to, be, you're going to have to live in for, an et for eternity. And eternity is a long time. But if thine heart turn away, so thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. And listen, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. 
So even God tells you, hey, make a right choice. Make the right choice. You, man, I, you know, choose life. Choose life. Joey, he, he tells me, Joey, just choose life today. Don't choose death. Don't choose to follow after that old man, that sinful way. Choose life today. Choose to follow after the spirit that I place inside of you. And you know what? Sometimes it's very hard, which it is hard to battle this flesh every day. Until we die, we're going to battle this flesh. Until we die. So we might as well just learn to battle it and win more often than we battle it and lose. Because there's going to be days, where we're going to have bad days, we're going to battle that flesh and we're going to lose. But thank God we can choose to pick ourselves up and say, God, forgive me. And battle it again the next day and choose life. And that, I love that about the Lord. God always gives us a choice. Though God tells us what is right, he allows us to choose for ourselves. Just like for our kids. Man, we can tell them every day what's right. We can tell them every day, you, you know what, but whether they want to choose it or not, it's up to them. And that's sad because we can live a perfect example in front of them. We can, we can be an example in front of them and they could choose to follow the path we choose in choosing life or they can choose to follow the other path in choosing death. I heard a preacher say one time and it years ago, Years and years ago, I, uh, I heard a preacher, a man say, he said, you know, he said, one day I woke up and realized that, that, that my kids may not choose to follow God. Think about that. My kids, you know, we all pray against that. We all just put that out of our mind. But you know what he said? He said, my kids may not choose to follow God, and they'll be lost. Amen. Brother Mike, they'll be lost if they don't choose to follow God. And there ain't nothing we can do about it. We can pray every day for our kids and, and for them to choose life and choose God. But if they fail to do that, they got to see their need in God. And they have to see that. And they got to make those right choices in God. Sure, they're going to make wrong choices. But uh, we've instilled the word of God in them. And that's all we can do. The word's got to take root for itself in their life. They, they've got to water that word in their life. They've got to water that word. Though God tells us what is right, he allows us to choose for ourselves. Our God-given gift is choice. One thing, he, when he made mankind, when he made him from the dust of the earth, he said, I'm going to put in you the right to choose. I'm not going to force you to serve me, but you're going to have to choose to serve me. It's often referred to as free will. It is one of the most amazing gifts God has ever given humanity. The freedom to choose. It'll either show two things, self-restraint, or it'll, it'll show that, that, they're, that they're out of control. Quick review of some of the major Bible characters who chose to do their own thing. Even though God had given them clear directions, is enlightening. Consider people like Balaam, Noah's uh, contemporaries, Lot's wife, what did she choose? Don't look back. Don't look back. Don't look back. And what did she do? She had to look back. Why did she look back? Who knows? Who knows why? We can speculate. Maybe she just, maybe she had family back here. Maybe she wanted to see if they were running out. Maybe, maybe, maybe she just was just curious. You know, what, what, what's it look like being destroyed? I, she heard all the noise and all the commotion of it being destroyed. Who knows? We can speculate a lot, but the end of it was she disobeyed what God had told them. Don't look back. Don't look back. And she was turned into a pillar of salt. King Saul, Samson, Demas, Judas. In every case, careful study would reveal that God was trying to save them from themselves. And, you, you know, the the... The easy part was God saving us from sin. He, he canceled that debt out by going to the cross. The hard part is God trying to save us from ourself, from our own self-harm, from our own, our own out-of-control actions and our own out-of-control bad choices. God has to, you know what, but some, it, that lies on us. That's not on God. It's not God's fault we don't make the right choice. 
It's not God's fault we don't get up and make the right choice to choose life. God just gives us a choice. He tells us, hey, choose life. I give you the ability to choose every day of your life, but choose life. Many of the people in the Bible that, 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 that God was trying to save them from themselves, many people, the Bible talks about, the Bible declared God's judgment on the refusal to choose life. Second Timothy 2.25 says, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Think about that. They, when they, their choices oppose themselves. The choices they make opposes themselves and they, they, they obstruct the blessings and the, and, and, and the beautiful gifts that God can give mankind. They obstruct that in their life. Think about that. Part C here in our flesh. We struggle to choose between good and evil, and that is so true. All human beings, we are constantly being invited to choose between good and evil. In short, this life is all about deciding whose kingdom we want to join, and that's the it. Whose kingdom we want to join, Who, uh, you know, choosing between good and evil. Every day of our life we have that choice, and God give us that choice. Uh, Romans 8 and 7 says, The carnal mind is enmity against God. For it, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. In order to, pre to prevail, we must receive the necessary grace, forgiveness, and the overcoming power of God. Paul uh, wrote in Romans 7, uh, 14 through 25, I'm going to read... Uh, this is out, they got it here in the book out of the Message Bible. I'm going to read it out of the Message Bible here. Uh, I'm going to read Romans 7, 14, 15, and 16 out of the Message Bible. And there's, there's uh, several scriptures here we're going to read out of the Message Bible. Uh, Paul talks about uh, how this carnal mind is an en enmity of God. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? And he answers, yes. He says, I'm full of myself. After all, I spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another. Doing things I absolutely despise. And that's it. We know in our flesh we despise some of the choices we make, but we can't help ourselves because it's flesh. This flesh just rears up. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. And Paul was saying, hey, we need God to instruct us. We need God's commands. We need to be reminded every day to choose life. We, I, I know this is just, a, you know, we've heard this before, but we need every day because we're battling this flesh. We need to be reminded. We need to hear the commandments of God. When God says, hey, folks, just choose life. He needs to wake me up every morning and say, Joey, just choose life today. Don't choose death. Don't choose to follow that sinful nature. Our well-meaning, sincere, best judgment is not enough. We need God's word to tell us what he expects. Even when we want to do what God asks, we will often find ourselves frustrated. And I'm going to read Romans 17 through 23 out of the Message Bible. But I need something more, Paul declares, for I know that, for I know the law, but still can't keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. Isn't that sad? I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. Paul's just telling, Paul's just being real here. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions 
something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me uh, covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. And, and you know, we, we understand that, that, that our flesh is going to rear up, and it's a constant battle, a constant battle for us. My spirit wants to do right, but my flesh and sin want me to rebel. So what is the solution, Paul asks? And this comes out of Romans 7, 24 and 25. It's out of the Message Bible too. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope and there is no one who can do anything for me. Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted, he acted to set things right in his life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Our only hope is daily surrender to God's Spirit in us, and that's our hope. We've got to surrender to God's Spirit in us, which gives us authority over sin and self. Good, good wins because we choose to give, the, to give God permission to run our lives, and that's it. We've got to say, God, I want you to run my life. God, I want to choose life every day. God, I want to choose you and, and not self. I want to choose you and not the self-harm that I cause on myself. That's the key. Every day we got to get up and choose Christ. We got to choose to serve God. We got to make the right choice. We got to put our best foot forward. I say a lot of times, Lord, help me put my best foot forward. Help me put my best foot forward. And my best foot forward may not be your best foot forward. Because we're all going to be on different levels on our best foot forward. Amen. Part two talks about here the rivalry between Cain and Abel. Uh, part A says Cain and Abel brought sacrifices to God. Uh, the difference between being spiritually minded and carnally minded is right here. Cain and Abel uh, was illustrated in the lives of the first siblings on the earth. But we have to understand God was specific in the sacrifices that they needed to bring. I, I do believe that God just didn't tell him that's not the way God works. You know, the, the Bible don't really tell us how, how God told him to bring the sacrifice, but I believe he told them, Brother Chuck, he had to. He told Cain and Abel the type of sacrifice they need to bring. He told Cain and Abel what they need to do because that's the way God works. That's the way God works. God is always specific about what he expects from us. He's always specific about what he expects from human beings. He's been very specific. We know we're supposed to serve him. We know we're supposed to worship him. We know we're supposed to get up and choose life every day. But God is always specific. And we know in part B here, here that Cain did not offer his best. Because God rejected it. Why did God reject it? I, you know what? I don't really know. I've, I've been thinking on this for two and three days. Was it because one was a blood sacrifice and one was bloodless? I don't know. Was it the certain type of fruits that he was offered? Did he just go and just pick any fruit out of his little garden there and try to offer to God? I don't know. It doesn't really say. But, we, but one thing for certain, we know God rejected Cain's offering. We know there was something about Cain, and I really don't think it was about the offering that God rejected. I really don't think it was about the fruit. I really don't think that. I believe it, the, the problem lied in the, in, the, in the man's heart. I believe the problem lied right here, right here in the heart. And we find out anytime we struggle, anytime that, 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 that we fall, Anytime that anything uh, uh, that causes us to lose ground with God isn't on God's part, it's going to be, we're going to find it right here. If we search, if we get back and look in that mirror and say, hey, you're the problem, man, self. You're the problem. And I love that in verse 7 when God asked Cain that question. Bring verse uh, Genesis 4 and 7 up if you don't care. 
We know Cain did not offer his best. Genesis 4 and 3 makes it clear Cain, Cain brought a gift to God. Cain may have reasoned he may have reason he was offering his best because he was bringing the fruit of his labor to God, just like his brother. After all, Cain was trying, and it did cost him something. We have to understand that. However, God does not give us the liberty to tweak his expectations any more than a police officer would let someone off the hook for speeding just because a person was running late for church. And think about that. We can't tweak God's word. We cannot tweak the word of God. And I like that in verse 7. And God asked Cain this question. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? What's the answer to that? Yes. I believe with all my heart, Brother Galen, the answer to that question, God was asking Cain right there. If thou doest well, Cain, after he rejected that, that, that sacrifice of Cain, after, you know what, Cain got wroth. He got mad, he got angry, he got hurt. He, and, 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 and God said, Cain, I can't, I, can't, I can't accept that sacrifice from you. I can't do that. Then he asked him that question, Cain, if, if you do well, shalt thou not be accepted? You know what? I believe with all my heart, and you may not feel this, if Cain went to God and said, God, I'm so sorry. My sacrifice didn't meet your, meet your expectation. I'm so sorry, God, I missed it. I'm so sorry I was lazy, God. I'm so sorry. God would have accepted Cain right there. I believe that with all my heart. But you know what? Cain come to God with, with anger and wrath and, and malice toward his brother because he was angry and jealous at his brother. You know, what, you, you know what God said, Cain? I can't accept that in your heart right now. I can't accept that. That's not my way. You know how you're supposed to act, Cain. And that was the question. God, many times in their life, just think about Abraham and Sarah, didn't, didn't God ask him a question? Is anything too hard for God after they done, went and done it on their own? Many times that's the problem. We go and do it on our own. Amen. And many times we do that, God sits here and asks us a question. Joey, if, you was, if you'd done it the way I told you to, wouldn't I have accepted that? Or, or is anything too hard for me? Is anything too hard for me when we go and do it on our own? Many times we find throughout the scripture God asks those hard questions to mankind when they mess up. God always comes back with a question. Amazing how God works. Amazing how God works. We know Cain didn't offer his best. I don't know why, but I believe it was something right here in the heart of man that, that, that God didn't like. But Abel did offer his breast. Hebrews 11 and 4. Give me Hebrews 11 and 4. And I love what this says here. Genesis 4 and 4 tells us Abel also brought a gift to God from the fruit of his labor. The casual observer would have seen two God-loving people offering worship to God. Their outward worship would have looked similar, but God was measuring their worship much differently than a casual observer might. Abel's offering was giving in accordance to God's plan. Thus it reflected his best. And this is it right here. It says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent gift. How did Abel offer it? He done it by faith. That was the difference. Abel done it by faith. Abel done it by faith. We got to move and walk and talk and live by what? Faith. Every sacrifice we give, God's got to be by faith. Because you know what? Our flesh, we're so, we're, so, we're so weak in our flesh, it ain't even funny. But if we can move in the faith realm, if we can walk in faith realm, we can offer those perfect sacrifices to God. And God will accept them. Amen. God rejected Cain's offering, accepted Abel's offering. Genesis 4 and 5 makes it clear God did not respect Cain's offering which caused Cain to be angry. Cain felt he was being unfair to. Of course, that's our human nature. That's our human nature, just like if we're on jobs and one person gets the, gets the gets promotion and we, we maybe get left out. Maybe they worked a little bit harder than us. How, how do we feel? We, oh, that's not fair. That's not fair. Maybe they showed up on time and we showed up late. 
Maybe they stayed over when it was needed and, 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 and you hurried home or something. I don't know. Those are just examples I'm just putting out there. Sometimes we feel life's unfair, but thank God God is fair. God's always fair. First Samuel 15, 22 and 23 says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than, that, than the fat of rams. For, for rebellion is of the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and adultery. Ironically, Cain complained about the ramifications of, of his willfulness, but he never offered to change his attitude. And that's why I believe God rejected Cain, because he never offered to change his attitude, his heart, his rebellion, his self. You know, it, it, it all ties in together. Everything about flesh ties in together. Part E says, our worship must come from the heart. Let's see what time it is here. Uh, obedience is the best sacrifice God's Spirit calls for us to do one thing. God's Spirit calls for us to do one thing. Our carnal nature and the influence of the world call for us to do something else. Each person decides who gets the upper hand. Each person decides who gets the upper hand. This decision comes from the heart. The, obedience, the obedient believer responds to God and his instructions and does not expect God to adjust his point of view. Does not expect God to adjust his point of view. And that's what we need. We need to do the adjusting. We need to do the lining up. If, if there's any failure, it's on our part. It's not on God's. God's never failed. God's never failed. God's never let down. God's never quit serving. God's never quit. God's never stepped off his throne. God's never quit making righteous judgment. God doesn't sleep or slumber. Slumber, remember the other day, slumber means he's, he's not negligent. Anything that happens in your life that God allows, God's not slumbering. He's not negligent allowing that to happen. It's for your good, no matter how, how much it hurts sometimes, but it's for your good. He's not negligent. God's never made a negligent decision in his life. And his whole, he, he, don't, he, he, he completely exists out of... Out, from what we can even imagine, God's existence. He has no beginning and has no ending. He, he's always existed. Mm -hmm. But thank God. Part three here, God expects us to give him our best and nothing less. And nothing less. If we live life every day, just say, God, I want to give you my best. I want to do my best for you. And, we, and we, when we do our best for him, we do our best for others. I'm going to serve you to my very best ability. It may hurt if I stand during song service, but I'm going to do my very best. I may have to sit down three times during song, but I'm going to do my best. I'm going to sit down for 30 seconds. I'm going to get back up because I'm going to do my best. And God will accept that. If, he, if, he, if that's my best, if that's all I can do, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to give God everything till it hurts, till it hurts me. Part A here says sacrifice is necessary for us to be in right standing with God. Sacrifice is good for us. We give to God to show him how important we think he is. Not so he can see how special we are. When people commit their lives to a cause in obedience to God, it is a sacrifice. It will cost them something. Serving God is going to cost you something. We serve our family every day and it costs us something. We serve our family every day. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll work hours for my family, and so will Amy. We'll work hours. We, we, we'll, we'll, we'll limp to work and crawl home. We'll limp to work and crawl home because we're sacrificing for our family because that's our job. That's our job. We, we think that. We, we, we put that on ourselves. That's our, that's our expectation of ourselves. That, that's our job. We'll, we'll, we'll go to work when we don't feel like it. We'll go to work sick. Most of the time now they'll send you home, thank the Lord. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> if, if, they, if they got someone to cover you now. But if they don't, you may have to sit there. <laughs> Get in the room, you'll be all right. But 
God wants our best. I know, we, we need to, God wants our best. We'll do our very best for our, our church family. We'll serve. You ladies, we'll serve these dinners we got coming up. You we'll serve tirelessly for these dinners. Why? Because that's your best. You'll, you'll put your very best forward. You'll, you'll stand on your feet till your back hurts, won't you? Yeah, you will. I, I know you will. I know you will because you're going to push your very best forward. And thank God that's you giving your best. And that's what God requires of us, our very, very best. Part B here says, I will offer my best. The best response we can give to God's call in our lives is to say, I will offer my best and listen to this and will not expect a reward. It's one thing to offer your best to someone and not expect something back. But God, I want to give you my best and I expect nothing in return. If he never does nothing else for each and every one of us right here today, if he never answers another prayer for us, he's done enough already. He's answered enough prayers. My brother Mike, he's done enough for me. If, until the day I die, if God never answers another prayer for me, if I have to live on the street as a vagabond from here on out, God's done enough for me, Brother Galen. I can't expect nothing more from him. As long as he takes my soul to heaven, that's all I want. I will choose to follow God in every way I know how because that is my best service to him. I will not compare my sacrifice to the sacrifice of others. I will compare it to what he asks of me. And that's the thing. We can't compare ourselves to one another. Compare yourself to the word of God. Line yourself up to the word of God. Compare you, say, God, am, am I giving my very, very best right here? Am, 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 am I waking up giving my very best to you, Lord, and line it up to the word of God, not to somebody else? All right. I'm going to internalize the message here just a little bit. Let me read just a little piece of this. Let me, uh, let's see. All right, Jesus declared he had come to seek and save the lost. He has goals and plans that are above our pay grade. When he gives us an, an, when he gives us an impression or specific directions through a sermon, a book, or even a still small voice, we do not help his kingdom by coming, coming up with a better plan. We do not honor God by being heroic. We must do, we must, we, when we do not simply follow he cannot bless what we do. The pressure is off God. God knows what he is doing. He does not expect us to be the man with the plan, the savior of the knight in shining armor. He simply wants us to simply just follow him. And he simply wants us just to give him our very best. That's all God asks of us is, is we just follow his plan and do it with the very best of his ability. Just think about that. That's all God expects you today. Brother Galen, just follow my plan. Do it the very, be do it the very best of your ability. We can handle that. We may fail sometime. We may trip and stumble. But you know what? It's in us. God put it in us to get up and continue to follow his plan and do it with the very best of our ability. All right. Let's all bow our head as we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this word that we heard.